welcome to the Harneys Offshore Litigation Podcast. My name is Ian Mann. I am delighted to be joined by Andrew Chin of our Harneys Hong Kong office, who is a specialist in arbitration matters. Um, uh, he was here to talk to us today about arbitration and interim measures. Welcome, Andrew. It's a pleasure for you to invite me here. Thank you very much, Ian. Andrew, I'm going to ask you in particular about arbitration in, in, in the BVI, where I understand there is um, an Arbitration Act in 2013 that governs the international arbitration in the BVI and is modern and establishes the BVI International Arbitration Centre. How is that centre going? That centre is currently going very well. Some of the things which... Um people may not be aware is that there has been a recent push in various offshore jurisdictions like the Cayman Islands and the BVI to build their profile as international arbitration hubs. And I think the BVI is um, definitely one of those that are very active in, on the international scene. Take, for example, their panel of arbitrators. Now they have over 200 arbitrators from right. over 40, 40 nationalities. It just shows the international reach of the BVI, mm -hmm. which then used to be considered as one of the arbitration centers that you would go to if you have a dispute, but things have now changed. And, and when and, people look for sort of arbitration venues, I mean, one is sort of neutrality and, and a sense that the venue itself is going to be welcoming to, for all sorts of reasons, to all parties in, in the dispute, right? Yes, that is exactly correct. And the BVI and the Cayman Islands in this regard are well-renowned global financial centers. And the thing about these two jurisdictions is that the country is not affiliated to any ethnic group. So, for example, you wouldn't be concerned that if you were being presided over by a BVI arbitrator or heard by a judge in a BVI, they would necessarily be predisposed towards a particular ethnic group, unlike if you were in some other jurisdiction. So the advantage of these global financial centers, uh, as it implies, is that it attracts a clientele from all over the world. And this is why the BVI is the global financial monolith that it is today. And you've got a great choice on the panel of arbitrators of great experience from around the world who can sit there as well. Yes, exactly. And yeah. I happen to be on that um, panel as well. Well, that's I was hinting to try and get you to, to make that point. So <laughs> well done, <laughs> Andrew. And tell me, in terms of the, the Unstrail model law, that obviously must be, I mean, the BVI is a signatory to that. And that is a welcome to many practitioners who, who will just be familiar with that particular jurisdiction. Uh, yes, um, just for those who may not be aware of um, what, the UNSA trial model law and international commercial arbitration is, is uh, similar in intent and effect to what is the unit trial model law and cross-border insolvency. What it basically does is that it seeks to harmonize the legislation in various jurisdictions on this particular subject. So for cross-border insolvency, it seeks to harmonize um, laws on cross-border insolvency so that, you know, when you have in insolvency in one jurisdiction and you want to take it to another jurisdiction, you more or less have an idea of how it's going to pan out. The same thing with arbitration. So those jurisdictions which want to showcase itself as being pro-arbitration as a place to be, they will tend to incorporate the UNSTRAL model law on international commercial arbitration. And in this regard, the BVI has been a front runner together with uh, many important commercial jurisdictions like Hong Kong and Singapore. And it is very aggressive because if you look at the text of the BVI Arbitration Act, you see that it expressly incorporates in some instances, word for word, the text of the UNSUTRA model law on international commercial arbitration. So it just puts it yeah. beyond doubt that it has the UNSUTRA branding on it when you think of the BVI and the Cayman Islands. And so the model law is the rules which govern the arbitration. It's not to do with recognition of arbitrations, is it, or is it? Um, oh, recognition of arbitrations is being dealt with a separate international treaty it's called the New York Convention on the Recognition and Enforcement of Internet Arbitral Awards. And I, um, it is one of the most successful instances of international cooperation on the legal scene. So that 
treaty harmonizes the laws on recognition and enforcement of awards across 170 contracting states. So basically, it gives a very limited set of exceptions to enforcement of an award. The enforcement of an award is a default. So what you expect as an award creditor is that if you got an award and you want to go to any of these 170 jurisdictions to enforce it, you would almost be able to get it automatically as a right, barring very limited exceptions. And those exceptions are very narrowly construed. And so if you had a BVI award, and you wanted to enforce it in another country. Actually, for you, 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 the important aspect is that other country is a signatory to the New York Convention so that you can enforce it there. Yes, that is correct. So um, uh, that is the advantage of having a BBI arbitration, amongst other things. Let's talk about interim measures. I mean, I have to say, Andrew, that for me, over the years, what has kept offshore practitioners busy like me is, you know, pre the establishment of the use of the BVI Center and arbitration in, in the Cayman Islands was, was, in fact, a slightly different angle to it all. It was seeking to have awards, say, from Hong Kong or Singapore or mm-hmm. elsewhere, enforced against a judgment or award debtor such that execution could be levied against that award debtor in one of the, the offshore jurisdictions. I mean, that was very much sort of the standard bread and butter work. Does, has that changed? That uh, definitely hasn't changed. In fact, uh, that is much the bread and butter work of most offshore practitioners in um, the offshore jurisdictions when it comes to arbitration. However, things are of course changing. And now given that the offshore jurisdictions are simply you know, the hubs of where most companies incorporate. So a lot of requests for interim measures actually go before the BBI courts. For example, interim measures could include obtaining information to prosecute an arbitration because the registered agent of the various companies incorporated in this offshore jurisdictions hold important information that could enable the successful prosecution of an arbitration. Say, for example, who are the controllers of a particular company? And so increasingly, we see that there are a lot of applications in the BVI for interim measures for what is called Norwich Pharmacal Orders, meaning so, orders... I mean- I suppose that's slightly different to levying execution to enforce an existing award from another place. What you're very cleverly moving on to is the idea that actually you might use the BVI courts to Mm. obtain information to initiate your arbitration wherever it takes place in the world, including, say, the BVI. And so in terms of those sorts of assistive proceedings Mm. in the courts of the BVI, you would be what looking for information and maybe seeking injunctions and and those sorts of interim or pre-action type measures, would you? Yes, that is correct. And if I may illustrate the point, Ian, with some of the cases that our firm has been involved in, and I think illustration speaks a thousand words, we had represented client who was a PRC state-owned entity, the client has suspected that one of its consultants had deliberately set up a a consultancy company behind its back, marketed it as an independent entity, and made that independent entity sign a contract for commissions worth hundreds of millions of dollars for work in various Middle Eastern countries. So when it came to an arbitration where the client was being sued for those commissions, it had a very strong suspicion that it was being taken for a ride, but somehow it just didn't have the official information in order to show that this particular independent consultancy was being controlled by this other person. And why would you get that information from the arbitration itself, you know, through some kind Mm. of disclosure procedure? Why would you Mm. then have to go to the BVI courts for what? I mean, it sounds like sort of either a Mm. passing off or a diversion of opportunity Mm. (laughs) type fraud. Why Mm. wasn't the arbitration disclosure procedure, to put it that way, the right option? Ah, right. Because in arbitration, because of the emphasis on deal process, 
in most arbitral rules, you don't allow a party to make an ex parte application to the arbitral tribunal. So in this case, our client was concerned that he had been defrauded. And obviously, it didn't want the other side to know that, hey, I'm doing a fraud investigation on you. And the client was concerned if it made an application before the arbitral tribunal, the other side would then take measures to destroy evidence that could possibly link them to the fraud. So the client instructed us to take immediate steps in the BVI to obtain such information from the registered agent of the BVI um, consultancy. And, and I, suppose also so that, the, yeah. I suppose also that person in the BVI, that company, in other words, um, was not a party to the arbitration? Um, the company was the party to the arbitration. It was the oh. company that was suing us. And the client has suspected that this company was actually set up by one of its so-called trusted advisors in order to defraud our client. So which is why our client had taken such measures against the counterparty. And going back to your earlier question, Ian, as to why our client went to the BVI court. The advantage is that if you go seek an interim measure before a BVI court for a non-breach pharmacal order, that is what is called a seal and gag order, whereby the registered agent is prohibited from disclosing the fact that an application against that company is being made. So this is why the BVI courts are now increasingly seeing a greater workload coming from requests for interim remedies and arbitration. I see. So you're making the Norwich Pharmacal, and for people listening, a Norwich Pharmacal is an application against an innocent third party for information pre-action mm -hmm. that might enable you to prosecute a claim, including an arbitral claim, to allow you to identify the wrongdoers. And so that claim in the BVI, Andrew, although the BVI company was a target, in fact, the mm -hmm. innocent third party that had the information reposed in it was presumably the registered agent of that BVI company. So, so the soft underbelly of information, in other words, yeah. Exactly. So in that case, the BVI courts were extremely efficient and the BVI registered agent did not even pose an objection. In some cases, if the registered agent does not feel that you have a very strong case, they tend to fight the case in court. But in our case, the BVI registered agent simply held his hands up and said, okay, I'll give you the information that you need. Hence, our client got the relief in a matter of months. Application was contested. It could take up to six months or even a year. So they got the information they needed to then prosecute an arbitration, I think, in another place. And other interim measures, Andrew, of course, that I know you do are freezing injunctions in the offshore jurisdictions to assist arbitrations. Talk me through that. Right. So um, when you... Um, when it comes to seeking a freezing injunction, what you are trying to do is to prevent the other party from dissipating the assets before you can obtain an arbitral award and enforcing against that party. So if you knew that the other party was quietly siphoning off its assets so that even if you did get an arbitral award, it would just be a worthless piece of paper. So what most claimants do is that they ensure they do asset check on their counterparty, making sure that they're worth suing. And if there is any indication that the other side is softening of assets, you would take an immediate application in their jurisdiction of incorporation and seek a freezing order against them or in the a jurisdiction freezing. where the assets are located. Yeah, so a freezing so, order. Yes, um, exactly. That stops the unlawful dissipation of assets intended to defeat any judgment creditor once it had obtained judgment. Yeah, exactly. And if I can again indulge in my habit of storytelling, I'm just a newborn, so I am very now becoming more and more experienced in storytelling. Oh, well, um, congratulations. So it, I'm sure, I'm sure <laughs> your arbitration story helps your baby to fall asleep. <laughs> yes, um, exactly. It's a very good bedtime story. But just to enthuse our listeners, um, <laughs> to give them an example of, you know, how a freezing injunction works in practice. So one of the clients which instructed us on the freezing injunction was a cryptocurrency exchange. And various customers had defrauded our client by siphoning off cryptocurrency held in other customers' accounts to various third-party accounts. And so our client, after it discovered this misuse of account privileges, 
they did a tracing and they found that some of these monies were located in some third party exchange that is incorporated in the Cayman Islands. So what our client did was that it immediately instructed us to take out the freezing injunction against those assets that are being held by the third party in the Cayman Islands. This was in aid of an arbitration that is to be commenced in Singapore. And because it, this request for relief was so urgent, our client didn't even commence arbitration before it took out this relief. Mm, so it's pre-action interim relief. And did you say that the parties which you sought the injunction, the KMA, were not in fact the defendants in the arbitration? So they were third parties. So NCADs, not non-cause of action defendants. Was that what happened? Yes, that's right. This is another advantage of seeking interim remedies in the courts, because in an arbitration, you can only seek an interim remedy against the party in an arbitration. Whereas if you need Mm. an interim remedy to bind third parties, for example, the banks, or you need an interim remedy against a non-party defendant, you go to the courts. And um, crypto exchanges in your case? Yes, exactly. Fascinating. Andrew, thank you very much for joining us. I'm sure the listeners will be, that will have whetted their appetite, or in the the case of your young baby, put it to sleep. And (laughs) it was absolutely delighted to have you on the programme. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, yeah. 